Um, approximately 10 years ago, I bought the uh, Saros 1998 book, In the Spring Sales. And um, I, had, uh, I had so often used the so-called Saros dummy. Uh, because I, I needed to, uh, in my empirical models, to account for the speculative attack on the European currencies. And I was curious to know uh, how the person behind the intervention described it. It turned out that I didn't really learn much about this event, but instead I learned a lot, a lot about the workings of the uh, financial markets, and as a matter of fact, it turned out to be a real gold mine. The theory of reflexivity and fallibility has actually ha helped me to understand uh, the link between the fi financial markets and the real economy. And I am absolutely fully convinced that this is very important in order for us to improve uh, our macroeconomic modeling. We have to include the uh, implications of financial market behavior in our model. And this is more or less uh, what my talk today is about. Uh, but first I would like to say also that I, I am terribly honored to be here. And uh, the, the fact that, say, if I would have known, say, 10 years ago I, that I would uh, be standing here, I think th this is, in a sense, an evidence that uh, zero probability events actually happen. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the role of theory and evidence in macroeconomic modeling has a long history. And uh, I s uh, decided to go back 20 years in time, uh, revisiting Summer's 1991 paper, The Scientific uh, Illusion in Empirical Economics. He argues in this paper that, say, empirical modeling has not really been able to influence economic thinking. And he illustrates this with the representative agents approach and the use of sophisticated uh, uh, econometrics, VAR modeling, a la Sims, as he says. And then he argues that the, the, this model cannot explain the uh, vastly more uh, complex and rich economic uh, reality. So has the marriage between theory and evidence improved in these 20 years? I think uh, the, the, the uh, development of DSGE models is one of the more uh, important events uh, over this period. Economists have used it uh, uh, widely to uh, do empirical modeling. And um, so is that the, the uh, solution to, to, Sor uh, to uh, uh, Summer's uh, 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 paper? our critique. Many people would, would probably uh, say so, but I will claim in this paper that uh, there are still uh, significant and empirical, empirical uh, regularities in the data that these models do not uh, explain uh, seriously. And I will also argue that these unexplained features in the data are very much related to the uh, 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 financial market behavior. And um, the, the, to give the ba background for uh, this talk, uh, in the paper I discuss very briefly the, the uh, theory first versus the data first approaches to empirical modeling. And um, I would say that the DSG model is an example of the theory first because you start from a, uh, from a theory model, then you add on some stochastics and some dynamics but these are very often have the character of add-on features. The data first uh, approach would take the same variables, but uh, instead of imposing restrictions from the outset, they will uh, estimate the model as general as uh, uh, possible and then impose uh, only data relevant, uh, data acceptable restrictions. And I will use the co-integrated VAR approach here as a means of testing, uh, say, theory models 
And um, I will also show that at the same time, you can also generate a new hypothesis using this approach. To fix the, the, the ideas, I will uh, use a paper by Peter Ireland from two to 2004 and show how we can partly uh, um, test uh, the hypothesis underlying his, uh, um, uh, uh, the RBC hy hypothesis underlying his uh, DSGE model. And I will also show that the results actually generate a new uh, evidence that can be used to formulate new uh, 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 hypotheses. And it turns out that many of the hypotheses and the, uh, the underlying hypothesis of Ireland's model is actually uh, shown to be inconsistent with the information in the data. And I will also claim then that this is due to the fact that uh, economic models are not generally taking the non-stationarity of the data seriously. And this uh, non-stationarity has, in fact, very significant uh, uh, implications for how we do economic modeling. There is also a section about how to generate new hypotheses. I have called it the Sherlock Holmes approach to econometrics. I will not probably have much time to talk about this. I think it is one of the interesting parts of the, my paper, but I will cover it very briefly. And I will end by saying that I think it is time to reject the preeminence of theory over empirics. For those of you who do not know what the cointegrated var model is, I will very briefly describe it here. Most of you probably know the vector autoregressive model, which in, if it's, uh, say, properly well specified, it is just a, a convenient summary of the covariances in the data. And its usefulness is that it allows us to test and reduce parameters until further restrictions significantly change the value of the likelihood function. The CVAR model, the cointegrated VAR model, is essentially just a parameter restriction on the unrestricted VAR. And it imposes a re reduced rank restriction, which then makes it possible to uh, model uh, to combine different and cointegrated data in one model, and this can be used to describe short-run variations around moving long-run equilibria. We call it the pulling and pushing forces. The longer forces are divided into the forces that move the equilibria, the pushing forces, and they give rise to stochastic trends, and the forces that correct deviations from equilibrium, the pulling forces, which um, give rise to cointegrating relations. And in this sense, I think the uh, cointegrated VAR model gives the data a rich uh, uh, context in which they are allowed to speak freely. And this is something people, uh, economists, always jump at me. <laughs> I do not mean that data speak by themselves, because I don't think data can speak without theory. <laughs> But what I mean with this, you can take the analogy of, of torturing uh, people. They will probably tell the story you want them to tell. It may not be the true story, but this is exactly the same. When you torture the data, it will tell the story you want them to tell, but it may not be the true story. And in that sense, I think we need to, to allow data to actually speak freely about the underlying empirical re regularities. The uh, Peter Ireland's paper, A Method for Taking the Model to the Data, uh, was, a, a, a check, was uh, checked by uh, myself and uh, uh, Massimo Franchi. It is, uh, it is, a, it is based on um, utility maximizing uh, 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 representative agent with rational expectations. It is uh, describing a real business cycle theory very much a la Prescott, so you probably all know that. 
it is for a closed economy and no uh, government sector, so in that sense it is a very, very simple model. And I know there are much more sophisticated models out there. And we have also looked at some of the more complicated models. However, it seems like the same problems essentially also uh, 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 are, are relevant in this, in this case. The total factor productivity is uh, assumed to be an autoregressive one process with an estimated root of 0.9987. And as you all know, I guess, I mean, a root of one means uh, non-stationarity, but uh, Ireland is treating this as an evidence that the, the process is stationary, which is a little bit questionable. <laughs> uh, to make the model more flexible, uh, the VAR1 process is added to the system of, of equations. When, tested, when we tested the statistical assumptions of Ireland's model, they were essentially all uh, rejected. This does not yet imply that the, say, conclusions are wrong, but at least the statistical inferences are unreliable and the real business cycle conclusion might be correct or, or, or incorrect. We simply do not know. And it actually turns out to be uh, incorrect in, in many aspects. And this is a good illustration of uh, why. You can see here, these are steady state deviations from capital, uh, uh, total factor productivity, income, consumption, and labor down here. And in, for the first four steady state deviations, none of them cross the zero line in a period over 40 years. So this cannot be a good property of, of an economic model. So uh, in, in, in the paper by myself and Frankie, we then performed a CIVA reality check of Ireland's model. Uh, and this was done by specifying a theory consistent CVAR scenario by recasting Ireland's hypotheses as statistical tests on the pulling and pushing forces in a well specified uh, VAR model. And I, this is a way of actually, I think, bridging the theory, the abstract theory, and the empirical evidence uh, in a way that makes it. When we accept a model, we can be reasonably sure that it is actually uh, empirically relevant. The first substantive hypothesis that uh, the sample period defines a constant parameter regime was tested and was very strongly uh, rejected. There seemed to be a fundamental regime shift at around 1980 in the data. And the reason for this was that the division into pulling and pushing forces seemed to have changed and a new source of persistence seemed to influence the data. Just to give you an idea of what the data told about Ireland's model when they were not silenced by prior restrictions. The number of stochastic trends were two or three in the data, whereas one in Ireland's model. The two driving forces originated from shocks to consumption and labor in the data, whereas from total factor productivity in Ireland's model. The lag order of the VAR was two in the data, whereas one in Ireland's model. And uh, the variables were trend, trend non-stationary in the data, whereas trend stationary in Ireland's model. And furthermore, some important information was obviously missing from the second period. But altogether, the conclusion was that the basic pre predictions from Ireland's DSGE model fell outside the confidence bands of the economic reality. Many economists would now argue to say, well, uh, this is not so surprising because economic models are not meant to be close approximations of, uh, to the economic reality. But I think this is a little bit too easy because the strong evidence of non-stationarity, and uh, this is now unit root non-stationarity -stationarity and breaks, 
point to a more fundamental problem with many economic models, which are very often intrinsically developed for a stationary world, despite some added on persistence and dynamics. The presence of non-stationarity has, among others, strong implications for how to model expectations, for the Ketteris paribus assumptions, and for the role of risk versus uh, uncertainty in the model. There are more implications, but these are at least very, uh, three very important ones. First, very briefly, the role of expectations, forecast from constant parameter theory models assumed to be correct from the outset, very often perform uh, poorly in a non-stationary world. And uh, David Henry here has done a lot of research exactly on this aspect. Rational expectations assume economic agents who are able to recursively foresee future outcomes with known probabilities. And this is incom incompatible with structural breaks in the data. The theory of imperfect uh, uh, knowledge economics by Friedman and Goldberg avoids such unrealistic assumptions and is consistent with structural breaks and non-constant model parameters. But there is one key implication of IKE, uh, which I think is really crucial, and that is that imperfect knowledge can lead to greater persistence in asset price fluctuations than uh, implied by the uh, uh, rational expectations-based uh, uh, models. And this uh, um, uh, additional persistence is exactly the one which we find in, in our empirical models of the macro, uh, of, of macro economy. The role of Ketteris paribus assumption is also, uh, I think, extremely important in a non-stationary world. All economic theory models are based on the Ketteris paribus assumption, everything mm -hmm. else equal. But in a real life, no, econo or, or at least very few economic variables can be kept artificially uh, uh, fixed. And the implication of leaving out a Ketteris paribus variable from the empirical model is likely to be strongly affected by its order of integration. If, if stationary, the, the conclusions are more or less likely to be robust. But uh, if they are non-stationary, conclusions very often drastically change. Therefore, uh, the empirical problem needs to be addressed in the context of everything else changing. And the uh, impact of the Ketteris paribus assumption needs to be taken care of uh, by conditioning in the empirical model. I will now show you the, uh, say, some of the, the, the uh, uh, features we see from the data by, uh, when we do it from the data first uh, uh, approach. This is now Ireland's data. I used the cointegrated uh, analysis based on it. I found that the sample had to be divided in two because there was clearly a structural break in, in 1980. And here you can see the steady state deviations from, say, this is the first period. There are two relations. One is more or less a Cobb-Douglas production function, the other is a, Time, uh, type of uh, income consumption relation. And you can see the steady state errors are pretty stable and looks very stationary. In the next period, you can see there is a lot of persistence that uh, has not been taken care of by the data. Something has happened in the second period that now has generated additional persistence that clearly has a strong impact on these variables. And I will claim later on that this additional persistence is due to the uh, uh, financial market behavior. And I was also very uh, uh, intrigued by reading uh, Soros book when he talked about the super bubble that started in the 80s. Because we very, very often find that uh, there is a structural break in, in the 80s. 
mechanisms are, are different after the 80s than before the 80s. And I, I believe this is related actually to the globalization of the financial markets and probably the uh, uh, expansion of credit in the global economy. Now to the, uh, the, the how much time do I have? Five minutes. Five minutes. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes econometrics. It turns out that data very often refuse to tell the stories they are supposed to. And that, in my view, points to the need to improve our economic thinking. And I believe also it is in the spirit of Sherlock Holmes that the CVAR can inspire new economic thinking based, and based on the following principles. Data should be allowed to speak as freely as possible against the background of not just one, but several theories. Falsification is more important than verification, and results that go against conventional wisdom are more interesting than confirmatory uh, results. And I can tell you the number of times I have found that conventional wisdom is not really supported by the data is almost astro astronomical. <laughs> it's, uh, it's very, very dangerous to, to, to try to uh, uh, to trust the, what you call the maintained view. <laughs> and I think this CVAR approach has a Marshallian rather than a Valraisian flavor. Now, because I do not have many uh, minutes left, I think I will just mention a few of the, say, uh, results that we have found by doing this kind of Sherlock Holmes econometrics. First of all, the fact that there seems to be a structural break in the 80s is a very strong and robust finding. And it points to the uh, importance of financial markets. We also have found uh, in, in uh, the, the financial behavior in the foreign currency markets uh, generate these very long and persistent swings in real exchange rate and in real interest rate differentials. These have a, a very, very important implications for the macroeconomy, both for the uh, potency of the monetary policy and fiscal policy, and for our macro models. And we have a lot of evidence on this part. The financial uh, behavior in stock markets, this is very, very recent. We have just started it. But it seems at least that, say, the predictions from, uh, from uh, uh, say, the, the uh, reflexivity and fallibility hypothesis come uh, through very strongly. And it uh, uh, the implications from these persistent movements, the booms and bust behavior from the stock market seems to also uh, have a strong impact on the economy, uh, partly on the demand for housing and house prices, and partly then on private consumption. So there is this kind of, of, of strong feedback effects from the financial sector to the, the uh, I will now uh, skip the uh, remain uh, and, and jump to the conclusion. The stories that the Tellman allowed to speak freely seem to be inconsistent with rational expectations-based models, whereas reasonably consistent with an IKE-based framework. Data also speaks strongly about a, a reflexive relationship between the financial and the real sector of the economy, as argued in Soros. And I also would say that following a Sherlock Holmes type of empirical approach, it seems possible to formulate new hypotheses that have the potential to inspire new economic thinking. Then I have a last uh, slide, which is uh, possibly a little bit more, uh, yeah, but it, it just, just leave it there in, in case I have one <laughs> minute for, for questions. Yes, okay. <laughs>